Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, we're going to learn from the book called Pinei uh, Amoadim al Pia Ben Ishai. Uh, it's a book written by the Ben Ishai. It's uh, on the uh, different uh, festivals of the Jewish people. You know, every month we have a festival or a fast. Uh, the month of Tishrei, which corresponds to roughly September, October, some years different, uh, has usually three festivals. And uh, but the three greatest festivals, the three biggest festivals of the Jewish people, are called uh, Sukkot. It's uh, the time of the year where the Jewish people live in, uh, might say, small huts. To, for different reasons, the most known reason is because the Jewish people, when they left in Egypt, when they left Egypt, uh, we lived in huts for 40 years. And uh, the second festival is Pesach, Passover. That's when uh, basically we commemorate the leaving of Egypt itself, and the three, the ten miracles that, uh, or the ten makot that were uh, that Moses performed on the Egyptian people to force Pharaoh to let us go. And the third one is Shavuot, which is the festival that uh, commemorates the Jewish people uh, receiving the Torah. Now, one important thing is when the Jewish people, when we uh, celebrate our festivals. We're not celebrating something that once was. We're celebrating something that's happening right now. We're not a people of tradition. We live our festivals. Every festival that we're... Like, for example, Passover. When we commemorate Passover, the leaving of Egypt, we're not just commemorating something that happened 3,000 years ago. We're commemorating something that's happening right now. The rabbis teach us that when Passover comes, every year it's an auspicious time for the last redemption to happen again because just as the redemption happened 3,000 years ago during Passover beginning of spring so to every single year the redemption happened at that time now the Jewish people read a portion of the Torah every single week now the portions of the Torah that correspond to the leaving of Egypt are six portions starting from the new book which we're starting this week called Shemot and uh, six for six weeks we're going to commemorate every part is going to talk about the from how we left Egypt till we received the Torah on Mount Sinai now the Jewish people when we left Egypt the uh, Talmud says a uh, verse Kimei tetcha me'erit mitzrayim are enoni flaot which means just as uh, you left Egypt, I showed you great wonders, so too will I show you at the end of times, in the redemption. Which means, anything that happened during the redemption of Egypt, when we left, all the miracles in the splitting of the sea, the same magnitude of miracles will happen at the last redemption. Which is something that makes very much sense, because in the redemption of Egypt, we were all living in one place, in Egypt, all the Jews. But imagine, in the last redemption, which will happen soon in our days, the Messiah, Mashiach, has to has to gather all the Jews from all the places of the world and bring them close. Now, very interesting point is, when we left Egypt, 80% of the Jews perished before they left. Why was that? You see, some Jews living in Egypt, they didn't have it so bad. They were big in real estate. They had owned many lands. They were in the government. In other words, they were content with what they had in Egypt. And they always went against Moses when he wanted to leave Egypt. Any time when he was making a miracle they wanted to leave, some Jews were always saying, no, we want to stay. So during the ninth uh, Makkah, or the ninth uh, miracle performed by Moses, which was called darkness, which uh, six days of darkness or seven days was cast onto Egypt, 80% of the Jews perished. And uh, it's something we must remember because when the last redemption comes along, and we know the same thing that happened in the first redemption will happen in the second redemption, the second in the last redemption. We all have to take upon them upon ourselves to believe when the Mashiach comes to all agree with him, and not like what happened during Moses' time, where many negated what he said and didn't want to go with him. And we see the Jewish people. The Torah says it witnesses not only witnesses it. The Torah says on the Jewish people that we're a very stiff-necked people. We're very stubborn. And any time God gives a person, doesn't matter what kind of person, any person, a attribute, a characteristic that's not so good, like uh, ego or jealousy or um, 
stubbornness, we all have to work upon ourselves to destroy that characteristic or use it for the good. Now, another thing the rabbis teach us. During these six weeks that we read the portions of the Jews leaving Egypt, it's an auspicious time to fix one specific sin. Any sin relating to forbidden sexual unions. Uh, it ranges from homosexuality all the way until spilling of the seed, especially for Jewish people. Now, the Torah says there is one sin that God hates the most over everything, and that is forbidden sexual relations. How do we know that? From the story of Bilaam. Bilaam was a non-Jewish prophet, almost as great as Moses, and a king of the Moabites called Balak. He hired him to curse the Jews, because any time he cursed the Jews, because any time he cursed anybody, the curse would happen. Why? Because he knew there's one moment of the day, one split-second moment where God gets angry. And he would knew exactly when this happened, and he would curse at that moment, and it would come true. Now, God loves his children, so he didn't let this plan come out. In fact, these are one of the things every Jew must remember every single day. It's one of the ten things we must remember. This story between Bilaam and the Jews. And uh, when he did, couldn't succeed, the man who hired him, the king of the Moabites, Balak, he was very angry. So what did he do? He so Bilam didn't want to. I you say uh, he didn't want to. You know he knew this broke his. Uh, so he told he gave Bilam a different uh, idea. He said the the Jewish God the God of the Jewish people he hates one thing more than anything. He said in Hebrew. I'm gonna say it on translate. Elokim shel elu son ezima. Their God hates forbidden sexual relations and what he do the king of the Moabites he brought the, the women of the uh, of his city and he and they seduced the Jewish men and 24,000 were killed because of that now the rabbis teach us especially the Mekubalim, the Kabbalists that these six weeks where we read a Torah portion is an auspicious time to clean any sins we did and we have to take control of this. We have to take, uh, seize the chance, seize the moment. Because the rabbis teach us, especially the Kabbalists, that all a person's uh, parnasa, his wealth, his, uh, his chance of finding his soulmate, his, uh, his, how, how much food he brings on the table, any, all of this thing depends how much he guards his private parts, let's say. And... Uh, the rabbis teach us also one thing. The Ben Ishai says this, and he quotes the Ariya Kadosh, that the Jewish people, when they left Egypt, they were they were a reincarnation of many different kinds of people. For example, it all started in time of the flood. The people during the time of the Great Flood, during Noah's time, Noah's time, they were a mighty people. Let's say they were very strong, smart. They lived very long years, but they were very bad people. The Torah with, uh, says that they. They sinned, especially in sexual things. They used to, the, the Midrash says, that they used to sin. They used to marry animals. They were very big into bestiality, homosexuality. And this is what, I you say, it stamped their, their judgment in heaven. When God saw this, he said, that's it, I'm destroying this. They have no hope. Hundreds of years he waited for them to come back. And not only that, 120 years it took for Noah to finish the uh, ark, and he was to, he was to build it in the marketplace, and he was every single day warning the people. Nobody listened to them. They called him an old fool. And what do we see at the end happen? They were all destroyed. But you see, the pasuk says in the Torah, the verse says, God has mercy on all the souls. These souls, these people that lived during the time of the Great Flood, they all perished. They came back in a reincarnation. In who? In the time of the generation of the Tower of Babylon. During that time, all the people of the world, they gathered in one place. Not everybody. There were some places that didn't, like Nineveh, which would be in modern day somewhere in Syria. They all ba ba gathered in Iraq, or modern day Iraq. And they built a great tower to make a war against God. God was very sad, let's say. 
well, it was happening, I mean, the flood happened not long ago, and now they're already trying to go against me again. And he, des and he destroyed the whole, the whole tower. But he didn't kill them. Why is that? He didn't kill them the way he killed these same people were the people at the time of the Great Flood. Mm -hmm. He didn't kill them. Why? Because they had one thing between them that he didn't have during the time of the Flood. They had love between a fellow man. It's called in Hebrew, Ahavat Chinam, selfless love. They cared about each other. So he just scattered all of them to the four corners of the world, and he destroyed the Tower of Babylon and destroyed that kingdom. Now these same people came back in a generation, as a reincarnation, in a generation of Sodom and Gomorrah. They lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. These were the same people. But this time, they messed up even worse. Not only didn't they have, they, were they deep into forbidden unions, and they were against God doing idol worship, but this time they didn't even have selfless love between each other. The rabbis teach us that, the Midrash says that in the tower, in, the, in Sodom and Gomorrah, they have specific rules over there. If a guest would come inside, and he was, they, he would come to a hotel. If he was very tall, they would put him on a short bed. And they would cut off his feet to make him fit in the bed. If he was too short, they would put him in a big bed. And to make him fit the bed, they would stretch his limbs until, of course, he would die. There was one story where the daughter of Lot, the nephew of Abraham, she, there was a rule in Sodom where you're not allowed to give charity. There was one old beggar over there, and she had mercy on him, so she decided to give him some charity. When the judges of Sodom heard this, they took her, covered her in honey, and let's just say let the bees take care of her. It's kind of evil people they were. And all those people, well, we know what happened at the end of Sodom and Gomorrah. There's not a memory of them left in the world. Now, these same people of Sodom and Gomorrah, which is in, in reality the people in the time of Babylon reincarnated, and the people, they were the people at the time of the Great Flood, came back as who? The Jewish people in, in the time of Egypt, they came back. These are the same exact people. So, in fact, they came back to fix all their sins that they made throughout all these three generations. And this is actually a very great secret. It's written by the Ari. And these same people that uh, were in the time of the great flood, really, and towards and continue, uh, continuing during the time of the ba Tower of Babylon and Sodom and Gomorrah, they were punished. That's why God punished them so severely in Egypt. And it says over there that when, they, when we were in Egypt, the Jewish people, God, God took us as, uh, I'm sorry, Pharaoh, he, he, said, he said to the Jews, if the Jewish people, they don't finish their Brick, they were, had to do a certain amount of bricks a day, if they, a certain quota of bricks. If they wouldn't finish, they would take the children of this Jewish people, or the person who couldn't finish, and use him as a brick. Why? It's the same punishment. Mida connected Mida. It's a punish, measure for measure. Since the Jews, these same people, they built the Tower of Babylon, measure for measure, they had to build bricks for a pharaoh. And measure for measure, since they do so many sexual... They were such sexual deviants at the time of the Great Flood. Pharaoh decreed on them they had to be thrown inside the river. And this is how God... You should know one thing. God, He judges everybody measure for measure. He does have mercy on you if you do truth, if you repent. But if you don't repent, He acts with you measure for measure. It says God, one of God's characteristics, not that He has a characteristic, God is infinite. But we have to talk about Him in a sense that we could understand. He's emet, He's truth. Since he's truth, there is no, how you say, bribery over here. You can't bribe God. You understand? God created this world. It says we have two days of Rosh Hashanah. Two, the Jewish people have two days of New Year's. Rosh Hashanah. Why do we have two days? The first day corresponds to strict judgment. That means if a person sinned, the second he sinned, he would get punished at that moment. But the second day corresponds to time, mercy. That means God gives us a chance to repent. And this is also one of the rules of the world. But let me tell you something. You only have a chance to repent while you're in this world. After you pass away in the next world, Olam Haba, as we call it, there is no such kind of thing as repenting. You can't say I'm sorry over there. Now imagine such a thing. You die after 120 years. You're in front of the. You're in front of God's presence, and the rabbi say there's a. And not only the rabbis, the, if you look at people who came back from the dead, had clinical death, they all say the same thing, especially the Jewish ones. There was a court 
they they judge them over there. Imagine sitting over there in front of the judges, in front of God's presence, and they show you your whole life. What kind of embarrassment you would feel? They're going to show you what you did in the most private of rooms, where you thought nobody was watching you. The Torah says, "What's worse, a thief that that steals at night, or a thief that steals during the day where people are watching him?" The answer is a thief that steals at night. Why is that? The person who steals in the morning where everybody's watching him. He's not afraid of people and he's not afraid of God. Or else why would he steal during the day? A person who steals at night, what is he proving? That he's afraid of human beings, but he's not afraid of God. And that's a worse crime. Upstairs in Shemaim, they're going to show you what you did in the most private of rooms. What you were watching, what you were doing. And there's no coming back after that. So you got to seize the moment right now. And why do I bring this up? Now, during these six weeks of Shovavim, we call it Shovavim. You know what Shovavim means? It means, in Russian, we say Chuligan. What's a Chuligan? A deviant boy. A boy who, how do you say, he's a little tricky. He's, he's not such a good, he's a bad boy. You know? These days are called the bad boy days. We got to take a chance and take our bad change our ways to, to ways of goodness and especially the sin where we spill our seat where people spill their seat unfortunately it includes masturbation we could change this we could repent during these days and these days especially God will accept our repentance because like I said we are the, the Jewish people during the time of the great flood were the same human beings that lived during time uh, the Jewish people during the time of the uh, um, the redemption of Egypt are the same people who lived during the time of the Great Flood. And what was their sin? Sexual deviance. And what did they have to fix? Sexual deviance. And the rabbis say that during the time of the last redemption will be the, the same during the time of the first redemption. That means if Messiah comes right now, we are the same people that lived during the time of the first redemption. Which, in other words, means we were the same people during the time of the Great Flood. So it's our job to fix this sin especially, like I said, in your Yisod, in your bris milah, it's your whole life depends on it. What Bilam said was true. God hates the sin the most. What happened when they allowed gay people to get married in New York? Not long after that, there was an earthquake. The Talmud says, how does God punish this sin? By earthquakes. We also have to take upon ourselves a mitzvah during this time, to make teshuvah during the days of Shavavim. To take upon our first step of repentance is never doing it again. Forget about tikkunim. First step is never doing it again. Take upon ourselves to fix this. Now, the Ariya Kadosh says, which is the master of Kabbalah, to fix one time of masturbation, you got to fast 84 days. Now, we can't do such a thing. But there is a secret, a shortcut. For every drop that left your body, one tear... Could fix every, for, could fix a, a tear, a drop for a drop. So if you take upon yourself to repent and cry to God, the more tears that come out, the more you could fix. I hope everybody enjoyed this lecture and take into consideration what I said. Have a good night.